On September 12th at 3 o'clock p.m., coordinated Universal Time, NASA Administrator Mike Griffin addressed the media with a wide range of topics, from recent issues to the retirement of the space shuttle. While the talk was around an hour long, we have condensed the juicy bits for this daily update. First up, Griffin talked about some challenges that NASA has recently faced. We've had some setbacks. I mentioned hurricanes, um, and it looks like they just keep on coming. Uh, on a much smaller scale, we had the high bolt failure out of Langley recently, an aeronautics research program that failed when the rocket's guidance system failed. You know, we'll figure it out and we'll fix it, but nobody likes it. And we had an Orion parachute test, you know, failure. Uh, but again, that's why we test. So uh, we'll keep doing, keep doing it. And we, uh, on the procurement front, we had to, are going to have to back up and do some rework on the uh, spacesuit uh, contract award, uh, which was judged to have had a couple of technical fouls. Uh, they, they were technical fouls, not failures of substance, but they still derailed the process. And so we'll have to, we'll have to rework it. He then talked about the space shuttle retirement in 2010. From 2010 to 2015, NASA will be without a vehicle capable of lifting humans to space and will need to lean on Russia for crew transit to the International Space Station. With Russia's recent actions in Georgia, is this such a good idea? Yeah, I, I, would, I have said, I don't know, dozens of times that, the, that starting with my confirmation hearing, that, that I absolutely deplore the gap in human spaceflight between the end of shuttle and the beginning of constellation operations for several reasons. And I won't reiterate those. I, I just think it's deplorable to have a program so arranged. Uh, but because of funding limitations uh, and pressures on the, on the overall national budget, uh, NASA has not been provided with a, a sufficient a bump in funding, if you will, to allow us to sustain shuttle operations until such time as new hardware could be ready or, or to accelerate the readiness of new hardware so, so that we could have a, a smaller period where, where we couldn't sustain station operations. So that's where we are. So it was a decision. It's, it's a, a feature, not a bug in US space policy. It was a decision to depend on the Russians during that time. That's a decision we made. If we now decide, as a nation, that we're going to extend shuttle operations, then for the foreseeable future, there will be no replacement systems, and we won't be going to the moon, and we won't be preparing the way to Mars, because there's not enough money to do both. Uh, next, I would remind people that there is considerable additional risk in continuing to fly shuttle, a point made by the Columbia Accident Board uh, some several years back. It was several years back, and we tend to forget uh, I was quoted the other day, correctly, as saying that at our existing uh, risk assessment for shuttle, about 1 in 80, if we fly 10 more shuttle missions, say two a year, if, if someone were to direct us to do that, two a year for the five years of the gap, that the incremental risk for those uh, 10 missions is a 1 in 8 chance of losing a crew. And then everybody draws a deep breath and, and uh, their eyes get wide. Well, that's a fact. I mean, that's the facts. That's where we are. Uh, I'd rather work towards spending our money on building a safer system. With the next generation rocket Ares and Orion, the next generation crew capsule, NASA is going back to the moon and then on to Mars. The question was raised asking how NASA can promote missions back to the moon so it doesn't look like a rehash of those old Apollo missions. <laughs> Comparing what we plan to do on the moon in the future uh, to, with what we did uh, 35 and 40 years ago um, it is truly night and day. Um, our visits to the moon in total were, you know, one human month on the moon uh, start to end. And uh, they, were, they were brief forays. The next time we go, we're uh, setting up the infrastructure for a permanent base on the moon, a research station, if you will. The comparison that I like to use, because I think it's the most apt, and, and I like to draw such comparisons with history, it's the difference between, you know, Amundsen reaching the South Pole 
and or 20 years later, Admiral Byrd flying an airplane to the South Pole and being there for hours or a few days versus going back in the 1950s with a completely different technology uh, in greater force and setting up for permanent stays in Antarctica. Well, today, 50 years later than that, we have thriving research stations in, Ar in Antarctica doing all manner of science never envisioned at, at the times when we first went back during the International Geophysical Year uh, and, and, and earning their own way in the scientific establishment as activities worth doing in a remote, hostile, and, and faraway place, a place that the first time human beings went to it was as difficult to reach as the moon. Now, I can't predict what people will find useful to do on, on the surface of the moon five decades from now, but uh, I'm convinced that the people of that time will, will find such things. Our job today is to provide those options. That's what we're in the business of doing. We're in the business of providing options for tomorrow's decision makers as, as our forebears provided options for us. And finally, with issues surrounding the development of Orion and Aries, it was asked if this is normal in a new design and if the whole process could be put into context. In light of history, everything always looks inevitable and easy. Um, if you know the history, you know the fits and starts of any developmental project. Whether it's a big one or a small one, a big one just means it's more people. It doesn't alter the fundamental character of the enterprise. Um, I personally worked on Hubble. I, I worked on some major defense system developments. Um, you can't work on any real development project, I think, if you have a little bit of humility without realizing that human beings are just not very good at figuring out how to do things for the first time. And, if you, and yet, if you're going to ever learn how to do anything new, there is always a first time. Uh, so you have to get a good concept, and then you have to do the, the hard work to turn the concept into reality, and you're always going to find out that there are things you don't know uh, but, but which can be fixed. So, you know, figuring them out and fixing them is what we do. Uh, the entire NASA update runs about an hour, and it's a great watch. If you have the time, you can see the entire event at tinyurl.com slash update. And remember that you can get all of your NASA and space flight news right here on spacevidcast.com. Subscribe to our channel on your favorite video sharing site or download the high definition videos in the podcast section of iTunes. We'll leave you with this final comment from Mike Griffin. Let me hit you with one more email just because it came in three times and it's, it was just, it's just so interesting I thought I'd ask. And it's despite all the ominous news reports lately, do you have any concerns about the Large Hadron Collider experiment in Geneva? <laughs> Um, those are pronounced hadrons. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, I don't have any concerns about the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, except that I wish we had built it here. Uh, that is an experiment that operates on the frontiers of science. It, it conducts experiments in particle physics that haven't been conducted since the Big Bang. And uh, I, I wish that we had uh, built such a facility here in this country because that facility will serve as a mecca for uh, scientific and engineering talent of, of all types in Europe. Uh, so what we're going to see is a, a brain drain to there uh, and, and the frontiers of uh, particle physics uh, will be there instead of here. So that's my only concern.